Welcome to Pure Passion. I'm your host, David Kyle Foster. Although the figures have varied according to the way the question has been asked in studies, what does 65 to 85 percent of lesbians have in common? Give up? They've all been sexually abused as children. That's right, well over half and possibly well over three quarters of all female homosexuals are victims of childhood sexual abuse. Now, I think there may be a connection, don't you? For the life of me, I don't see how gay activists keep getting away with claiming that homosexuals are born that way. That emperor has no clothes. Scientific and psychological data points to the fact that homosexual confusion is the result of developmental causes. People develop this struggle in reaction to things that happen to them and the way they perceive those events. Over half of all people with homosexual confusion, male and female, are victims of childhood sexual abuse. That is a huge, telling statistic. The connection is obvious. Today's guest is a lady who exemplifies that connection. She was molested as a child and eventually developed a homosexual orientation. Now, while most sexual abuse victims do not develop homosexual confusion, among those who are homosexual in orientation, there is a very high incidence of sexual abuse, as we've noted. The difference between those who go on to develop homosexual confusion and those who don't can often be found in multiple contributing factors. As you listen to Melissa's story, note the other factors in her background that contributed to the problem. It's a complicated subject that requires careful attention to detail because the healing process will need to address the causal factors in order to be successful. Now the story of Melissa Coffey, who by the power of Jesus Christ is no longer lesbian. I had several friends involved in homosexuality and just began listening to music and reading books. And then I met a woman my senior year and got involved with her. It was this emotional attraction and wanting to be connected to a woman and then when I was actually with this particular woman, it felt absolutely right. I thought to myself, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life. As it turns out, once I began walking out of lesbianism, I discovered this huge unmet need for feminine love. And I, as I looked at my relationship with my mom, I realized that earlier in my life, I had shut her out. I had detached from her because I viewed women, and specifically my mother, as weak, passive, and victims, and I decided that I wasn't going to be that. So I had no idea at the time that I'd shut myself down from that nurture, from that love. Well, her and my dad had a very troubled relationship. They both say that their marriage was, was troubled from the very beginning. He was never home and she never confronted him about his behavior um, in terms of leaving us. Uh, even though he financially supported us, he wasn't there physically or not really emotionally present. And I was very angry at him for leaving, but also angry at her for not challenging him. And I, I saw that she was financially and emotionally dependent upon him, and I decided I was never going to be that. I did not want to be like my mother connecting to her was not safe. So she loved us, but she also wasn't very emotionally present to us. She had her own brokenness. She would cry a lot, but she wasn't allowing us to express our emotions. So it was more that it was unsafe, but I never doubted that she loved me. I was somewhat afraid of men because I have an older brother who He's three years older, and we both were similar in terms of, of having very bad tempers. And so we would fight all the time at home when my mom was working and my dad was never there. And he was stronger and older, and so I always wound up on the losing end, feeling beat, beaten up and unprotected. So there was definitely some fear and just really anger towards men and did not, was not happy with my father and my brother. God made himself very present 
the entire time that I was in this relationship, was, which, which was actually quite a short relationship. From the time I met her until the time it ended was perhaps two months, which is also uncommon. But the entire time that I was with her, I knew God was making himself known to me, and I knew that I was choosing her over him. I, I was not peaceful at all, even though it felt right. Today I'm speaking once again on what does it look like to be healed of homosexual confusion. Your love for Jesus will now be born out of an abiding intimacy with Him. And that is now your strongest inner resource for deciding to turn to God to be set free. Often in the early stages of the Christian life, we haven't yet learned what love is and how to truly love another. We still see love in worldly terms, as an emotion, a feeling, and very much conditioned upon the object of our love remaining lovely to us. Thus, our love for God has not yet matured into the real thing, that which is sacrificial, unconditional, and self-giving. Love rightly formed must become the single motivating factor for obedience. Any other motive is religion, and it is death. The person who is healed has developed a deep and abiding love relationship with God, one that compels him or her to holy pursuits. The Bible teaches that the love of Christ is what compels us. For the healthy Christian, when temptation comes, the central reason for turning away is that the thought of hurting the Lord they love is too grievous to consider. During moments of intimacy with them, God has succeeded in writing His law on their heart. In other words, the desire to be obedient, to be holy, has become their natural desire, replacing the previously natural desire to rebel. Grace is what produces this result and this fruit in our lives. Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 11, tells us clearly that it is the grace of God that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to live upright and godly lives in this present age. In other words, it is in being forgiven again and again and again that we finally acquire the desire to be faithful to the Lord. Therein lies the value in seeing how dark is our heart and how fallen is our nature. It drives us to the grace of God. When God's grace continues in the face of the reality of our dark hearts, that rebellion in our heart becomes conquered by God's love. And we become persuaded that God has nothing but good in mind for us. He's not out to get us. He loves us. And we go from obeying Him because we're supposed to, to obeying Him because we want to. And beloved, that makes all the difference in the world to Him. God did rescue me. And I would say that in the moment, in the moment He rescued me, and He's been working ever since. So shortly, a month after my girlfriend broke up with me, I have an identical twin sister who has never struggled in her sexuality. She was involved with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and she invited me to Urbana uh, 96, which is a missions conference, through InterVarsity. I went and I heard Mario Bergner do a workshop. First time he was ever at Urbana, and he gave a workshop on sexual wholeness. And I gave my life to Christ in that workshop and repented of this particular lesbian relationship. Now, I wish I could tell you that that was that was it. It was over. I could go on and be a happy heterosexual. But it was several years um, where I was very isolated. I went abroad to Brazil to teach English, and then I came back home and wasn't really connected. But when I moved back to the Washington, D.C. area, I got involved with a local exodus ministry called Regeneration. And I began a, a support program called Living Waters. Now, Living Waters really helped me take a look at my family. And as I described before, take a look at my relationship with my mom and realize what was missing in terms of that legitimate need for feminine love. Also, I had to look at my relationship with my dad 
and, and reconcile with that. And so in the process of understanding their brokenness and understanding and taking ownership for my responses, such as I will never be like my mother, and giving those back to the Lord and saying, I can't defend myself anymore against these faulty images that I have. I need you to show me what it means to be a woman. That was back in 99, 1999. It is now 2006, and he's still doing that work in terms of, of restoring the feminine in me that I had disowned because it felt so unsafe. And then he's also working in my relationships with men, um, specifically men on the leadership team of Living Waters who would pray for me and bless me and show me the good of the masculine. And, and for me, being on the leadership team and then on staff, being able to bless them. So it's really been a long, a long process. Some of the other issues that need to be dealt with in looking at lesbian desires are the effects of abuse. Over 80% of women involved in same-sex attraction or lesbianism have been either physically, sexually, emotionally, or verbally abused. So I definitely believe that abuse is something that needs to be looked at. I was never um, overtly sexually abused. My brother was inappropriate at times. There was pornography in our household that I was exposed to. So it can be overt abuse. It can be subtle abuse. That's definitely something that needs to be looked at. Also, something called misogyny, the devaluation and dishonor of women that is happening in the culture today. Obviously, pornography and sexual abuse are the most overt examples of that. But simply valuing masculine activities over the feminine, valuing intellect over emotions. I saw that in my, in my house, that um, my mother wouldn't allow me to feel even though she was crying a lot. So there was that confusion. Some fathers don't know what to do with a little girl. Some mothers don't know what to do with a little girl because they're so broken in their own femininity. And so there's, there's no safe place to be feminine and, and all that that entails. Hello, I'm Joe Dallas, and we're talking about tips from the game plan. That's the plan for maintaining sexual integrity. Let's talk today about repentance from homosexuality. I remember back in 1984 when I repented of this sin in my own life, I began my journey wondering what it was going to be about. Well, let's talk about that today. Let's talk especially about the repentance aspect of the journey of recovery. You know, when you're angry enough or scared enough or frustrated enough, you take action. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you've looked at sin in your own life, homosexual or heterosexual, and you've either become angry at yourself for allowing it to continue, or you become frightened of its consequences, or you're frustrated over its futility. Well, all three of those roads lead to repentance. Now, to repent is to turn. That's the difference between repentance and confession. When you confess your sin, you acknowledge it. Well, that's important. And so John said in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. But confession alone isn't enough. God not only calls us to acknowledge our sin, he calls us to put it away as well. Now, repent is a word we sometimes associate with gloomy old men wearing sackcloth and lying in ashes. That's too bad because Repentance is a valuable and a very practical concept. It means to think differently, reconsider, and turn around. And no real changes are made without it. Repentance is the willful act of discontinuing a thing which is destructive and wrong, followed by an earnest effort to do what is constructive and right. Now, without confession, nothing is forgiven, but without repentance, nothing is changed. To repent, then, or turn, you need to first identify what you're repenting of, then determine the most effective way to do it. Exactly what do you need to turn from? Well, if your sin has involved homosexuality, that depends then on how you are expressing homosexual desires. 
Now, this is an important point. You can't just rip those desires outside of yourself. You can't just make them go away on their own. Repentance applies to acts of conscious will, whether they're outward actions or inward indulgences. That is what you are repenting of. You're not trying to repent of homosexual attractions per se. You're repenting of the expression of those attractions. Outward expressions of homosexuality include sexual contact, erotic non-contact behavior, whether through masturbation or sexual fantasy or internet sex. These are direct forms of immoral behavior. They're easy to detect and they're obviously immoral. Less obvious but also immoral are indirect expressions such as conscious lusting or sexual fantasies. And although those sins are inward, they're still conscious expressions since they involve an act of the will. So conscious lusting is the indulgence of sexual desires for another person. It should be distinguished from an attraction, although the line which distinguishes the two is a pretty fine one. An attraction occurs when a person gets your attention, arouses you somewhat, and causes what seems to be an erotic response that you initially turn from. Lust, on the other hand, occurs when you feel that attraction and you focus on it, indulge it, elaborate on it, or as some people say, undress the other person with your eyes. To be attracted and turn from that attraction is no sin. To lust is indeed a sin. Now, sexual fantasies are similar. They're like sexual lust. They're conscious acts of the imagination. And they too need to be distinguished from what we would call fleeting sexual thoughts. I love the way Martin Luther put it, speaking of impure thoughts, when he said, we can't keep the birds from flying over our heads, but we can keep them from building a nest in our hair. So wayward sexual thoughts come to everyone, I suppose, but when we indulge those thoughts by orchestrating sexual fantasies, then we're not just having fleeting thoughts, we're creating mental pornographic images. Now, all of those forms of homosexuality are so obvious, you probably didn't need me to point them out to you, but repentance shouldn't stop with them. You should also consider any activities that contribute to them or encourage them. Now here you need to be brutally honest with yourself. Are there any parts of your current lifestyle, habits, places you like to go, forms of recreation or entertainment you enjoy that encourage sexual immorality? Now this is a question every serious Christian has to ask himself, and it's a question that's doubly pertinent to you. Now, so often men can go on kidding themselves, then wonder why they're not making any real progress. They claim to want freedom, and seem willing to give up overt homosexual behavior, but they show an unwillingness to give up the very things that lead them back into that behavior. So an old hangout, for example, a place you like to frequent, a gym you go to where there may be sexual activity or a gay-oriented business. Is it possible to go to those places without doing anything inherently wrong? Oh, I suppose it is. But the question then becomes, how is it going to affect you? Does it stimulate lust? weaken your resolve, put you in a more erotic frame of mind? In all matters, the question should never just be, is going to such and such a place in and of itself a sin, but rather, do I have the liberty to go to this place without setting myself up to stumble? Will it encourage me towards my goals, or will it encourage me towards a setback? You know, Paul made an interesting admission in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, when he said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. I can do all things, he said, but I won't let myself be brought under the bondage of anything. Well, neither should you. So begin now, if you're truly repentant, by bringing every part of your life under scrutiny. And if anything you're involved with draws you towards the thing you say you're trying to reject, then drop it. That, in the truest sense, is repentance. I'm Joe Dallas. And these are tips from The Game Plan. Misogyny can definitely be learned and passed down through a mother who herself was a victim of misogyny, that in her life the feminine was maybe overlooked or abused because she was feminine. This can, this can take the form of verbal abuse, you know, you'll, you know, you're just a stupid girl, girl, you know, stop crying. I mean, of course, boys get that too from their fathers. 
but but just in terms of not allowing little girls to be little girls also especially if there's abuse just rejecting our own bodies as feminine because we've been abused and and self-hatred that's really where it comes from is that that devaluation of women is internalized and I hate myself because I'm a woman I hate the weak parts of me the emotional parts of me the intuitive parts of me if I hate myself and I have a daughter how am I going to affirm the feminine in her there's no possible way I have clients whose mothers didn't touch them I mean we're talking growing up not being touched by your mother because she was so disconnected from her own physical being and emotional being and so that f self hatred and that devaluation and dishonor is passed down and this particular client her brother was God everything was about her brother because he was male he was exalted and her parents worshipped him and she could either go along with the program or simply stay in the background and there was no room for her at all the first step to healing from self-hatred is to confess it as sin to admit before God you know what I confess that I hate myself I hate that you made me this way I hate my body I hate whatever it is that you particularly hate you confess that and you say I'm sorry because basically God created me and I'm created in God's image if I hate myself I am basically saying to God you know I'm putting my fist up to God and saying you can only come this far but you can't get past here so that's why we need to confess it we need to renounce it and then we need to ask him to show us how he sees us we need to get his perspective on it and so through prayer and hopefully supportive others in the body of Christ praying for us and affirming us and encouraging us we can say Lord I need you to show me how you see me I have a very faulty image of myself show me in your word show me with a picture show me in your creation how you see me and also choosing I had to choose to believe what God said about me in his word that I was beloved that I was precious that I was the apple of his eye all of these things and trust that he would change my feelings in time if I waited for my feelings to change it was never going to happen because I felt a lot of shame about my involvement in lesbianism so I think shame and self-hatred are also uh, tied together let's say I was overcome with self-hatred condemnation um, and trying to think of, of how I would pray in the middle of that I might say um, Lord Jesus I confess that I hate myself I'm feeling this self-hatred I feel worthless I feel shameful I feel dirty I feel separated from you but I know in your word that um, I've been reconciled to you through the blood of Jesus I plead his blood over me right now I just renounce Satan I renounce self-hatred I renounce any spirit of despair condemnation and I ask Holy Spirit that you would come fill those places where that self-hatred that I've just confessed has been put on your cross come with your peace come with your truth come with your mercy Melissa and many like her are my heroes they have resisted the blitz of deceptive gay activist driven media propaganda and instead they've turned to the Lord Jesus Christ for healing and salvation from a lifestyle that only brings death. Coming out from under childhood sexual abuse is difficult enough, but add to that lesbian neurosis and you've got quite a formidable challenge. Really, only God himself can untie such a Gordian knot. God wants to do that for you, just like he did it for Melissa. It was not his will that you were harmed as a child any more than it was his will that millions of others have been molested, tortured, and murdered throughout history. The evil done to you was done by evil men who used their free will to victimize the weak and the innocent. You can be assured their day of judgment is coming when the Bible says God will pay back with affliction those who have afflicted you. The good news is that in the meantime, you can move on and be healed. 
you can mount up with wings like eagles and soar with God to greater and greater levels of freedom and purpose of life. That's why Jesus came, to pay the penalty for the sins of those who would turn to him in repentance and give their lives into his hands. Do that today. Let God be your healer and your redeemer. Until next week, I'm David Kyle Foster for Pure Passion.